And again, welcome to the webinar. My name is Garen Hess. I'm the CEO and founder of Rapid Intake, and Rapid Intake's been in business for about 10 years. We started out as a service company creating custom e-learning for Fortune 500 companies, and about four years ago we began publishing e-learning development software based on best practices. And that's kind of just a brief overview as to the uh, reason that I'm presenting today is because of our experience in this area. We also organize and host an industry e-learning development conference called e-learning DevCon in Salt Lake City each year. We're not going to spend a lot of time in this webinar going over our products or e-learning development tools, although our tools are based on the philosophy that we're going to talk about today, which is instructional patterns. So if you want a, a more specific demo about rapid intake products, then you'll want to participate in a different webinar. And you can either contact me or you can email sales at rapidintake.com or just contact anyone at Rapid Intake to get that set up. You can also find a lot of information on our website. But for the most part, we're going to talk about some concepts related to instructional design and how to create effective e-learning, and then how use of certain types of technologies can improve your chances at creating effective e-learning and, uh, and, and get better e-learning without raising your costs uh, too much or introducing a lot of extra time into your project timelines. And of course, uh, our products can help you with that, but um, there are many uh, concepts, I think, that you can take with other products as well, and hopefully this will be helpful to you even if you don't use rapid intake products. So um, with that said, I also want to mention that if you have a question, please pose it in the question panel. And I will be looking at that periodically. Um, I can't uh, guarantee that I'll be able to get to every question. We usually have hundreds of people attending um, in this webinar so far. We've got about 100 uh, attendees, and we expect to have about 125 or so um, logging in. Um, we had about 250 register, and we typically get about 50% uh, attendance rate. That's a pretty common attendance rate in webinars. In any case, um, what I'm going to do is go ahead and get started with the webinar. And I'll probably ha um, take questions mostly at the end. Um, but if I do feel like I have time, then we will take questions at, uh, in the middle. Looks like some of you are saying the audio is cutting out. Let me see if there's any way I can remedy that. Give me one moment, please. For those of you who have, um, if you could just, let me, let me uh, do this. Some of you are saying the audio is fine, and some of you are saying it's cutting out. If you could raise your hand if the audio is sounding good, Please go ahead and do that if you don't hear any problems really with the audio. Okay. What that probably suggests, most of you are hearing the audio just fine. So for those of you who are not getting a good audio connection, um, I recommend connecting by telephone if you can, if you happen to be connected with your computer, microphone, and speakers. Uh, maybe log them out or log them in. Somebody's suggesting here, so appreciate that. So uh, it sounds like the audio coming from my end is, is uh, doing OK. It may be a problem on your end. So you can definitely call in to the phone number if you want, or maybe uh, try relogging in to get a better audio connection. So thanks for all of those of you who responded to that. So with that said, I'm just going to hide the question panel here for a bit. And we'll go ahead and get started with uh, with the actual content. So thanks for being patient with that. I'll lower the hands now. OK. So what this webinar is really about is breaking the quality versus quantity trade-off. 
So the problem is that when you're creating e-learning, it's so often a question of uh, can I do this fast or can I do it well? And I want to introduce some ideas that may help you uh, get both. Um, obviously, uh, the fastest way to create e-learning uh, may not be the best way. Um, when we used to do custom course development, I would have people ask me, so how much does it cost to put an hour of e-learning online? And I would always respond, $50. And of course, that always elicited an a, a incredulous response. And they'd say, well, that's impossible, $50. There's no way. And I'd say, sure, just give me your, your Word document or your PowerPoint and I'll make a PDF out of it and I'll post it online and I'll charge you $50. And so that immediately would illustrate the, the problem with the question, which is e-learning is such a broad term that, it, you know, it's electronic, a PDF is electronic and it's online, but of course it's not really what we're thinking of when we're saying e-learning. Um, but there's a wide variety of, of ways that you can create e-learning content um, everything from, you might even say, a PDF to uh, full simulations like a flight simulator that the military uses. So there's a wide spectrum there, and the level of interactivity really does have a tremendous amount of impact on the amount of uh, learning that goes on, or potential learning. And so the challenge uh, so often has been, well, if we want a lot of interactivity, it's going to cost a lot, it's going to take a long time. But that's, that's the uh, point I'm trying to make, is that it doesn't have to be that way. Now, to be able to do that, you may need new processes, and you may need new technology. Um, but there are obviously these benefits here for doing that. It costs less to develop, takes less time to create, easier to maintain. Um, than doing it in a, a traditional from the scratch method. So uh, this is the benefits. These are the benefits of instructional patterns. So when e-learning started in general, um, you know, back in well, won't go into the detailed history, but let's just say for all intents and purposes, it started in the mid '90s, and we'll say around the time of the internet. It obviously existed before then, but um, you know, the internet has helped it take off quite a bit, but it took too long to create, cost too much, and it was hard to learn the tools related to that. Um, Clark Aldrich wrote a book called Learning by Doing, which is a great study in how to build full simulations. Um, he built a leadership simulation, but there's an interesting chapter right at the beginning that talks about basically the phases of technology adoption. and. In the magic bullet phase, the, uh, he has this quote, vendors and consultants lured by open purse strings stoke the assignment, widely advertising the vision rather than the reality of what can be done. And I would say e-learning was kind of like that, especially on the internet, internet-based e-learning, you know, back in the late 90s, early last decade. And the costs were enormous, so thirty to $50,000 per finished course hour. And we used to charge rates like this to do course development. And it used to take months and months, sometimes over a year, to do a large project. Um, and so you obviously, th these are not, th it was not scalable. The other problem is that the tools were very difficult to learn. So there were just a select few people that could use them, and uh, mostly technical. And we used to train people. We used to go to corporate sites and train people on Flash and Dreamweaver, and, and my business partner and I, many years ago, wrote uh, books on using Flash and Dreamweaver to create e-learning, but they are very difficult to learn. Um, they're still great tools, and you can build just about anything you want with them, but they are difficult. And of course, there's always the Flash problem now of does it port to uh, mobile devices that don't support Flash, such as the Apple devices, but that's another topic altogether. But it was, it was too complex. So these are just some of the problems. Um, the other problem is having to clone the subject matter expert. So, and this still happens today, but I believe that we're moving away from this more and more and that 
more and more technologies will make it easier for subject matter experts to create effective e-learning. But the, basically the problem is that an instructional designer has to learn what the subject matter expert knows to be able to create the content. And even though as an instructional designers we might say, well, we don't have to learn it as much or as well, well, that's sort of the problem. We learn it almost as well and we get sort of a half halfway clone. <laughs> so, hence the graphic here. So these are, again, just some of the problems related to it. And so what happened was we sort of moved to a state of confusion phase where everybody said, hey, this has cost too much, it takes too long, it's not really maybe as effective as we thought it would be, it's not quite the silver bullet that everyone thought. And Clark Aldrich sums this up by saying at some point after the initial excitement, sorry, that's uh, covered up by my graphic there, initial excitement, finding new successes becomes quite difficult. Even some of the early examples of success no longer seem quite so successful. And e-learning uh, around that time, maybe six or seven years ago, really struggled um, as, an, a, as a technology in general because it, it, there, there was no real good scalable solution. So then the question became, how do we shorten time, time requirements, reduce costs, keep from having to clone SMEs the way we do? Is there another silver, is there another silver bullet? And so really the silver bullet that everybody thought was the silver bullet was PowerPoint. So we immediately saw this, this huge influx of um, PowerPoint conversion tools. And most e-learning development tools will convert PowerPoint today. And it sounds great in theory. Hey, you're, you have a PowerPoint? Well, we can put it online. Hey, you, you know how to design in PowerPoint? Well, now you can create e-learning. And I remember standing next to a vendor at a trade show that, where their tool was designed primarily on PowerPoint conversion. And, they, and that was their pitch. They were saying, hey, you look, you, you know PowerPoint, you can make e-learning. And that's sort of like saying, you know Word, so you can create a PDF and call it e-learning. I mean, it's obviously PowerPoint's a little more interactive. But, you know, e-learning is such a broad term that to say that you know PowerPoint so you can create e-learning sort of misses the point. <laughs> um, because you really want to be able to design effective e-learning, not just any e-learning. And so, uh, but PowerPoint still did sound great. Um, and, and it is great in a lot of ways. In fact, PowerPoint conversion really in a lot of ways saved the e-learning concept from dying off. And, and Clark Aldrich describes this phase in technology adoption like this. He says, the technology, adoption, or the technology should just die but then something happened. Groups from all over recommit. They sacrificed some of the artistic and philosophical purity, even some of the quality, in exchange for something scalable. And so what did we do essentially? We said, oh, well, we won't build custom e-learning anymore. Obviously, people still do that. But um, as a general, you know, for most of our courses, we're going we're gonna to use PowerPoint. And so, yes, we're, we're, we're sacrificing some of the artistic and philosophical purity, um, even some of the quality, right? There's the, there's the catch there. And I'd say some of the instructional quality. So I'm going to ask another question. Um, how many of you like homemade bread? Just go ahead and raise your hand if you, if you love homemade bread. Okay, yeah, look, like you've got most of the, most of you are saying you love homemade bread. I love homemade bread. And some of you are thinking, boy, I don't remember the last time I had homemade bread. <laughs> I'm going to lower the hands. Now let me ask another question. How many of you uh, make homemade bread regularly? Okay, well, you know, just maybe a couple of hands here. We might have 10 out of a well over 100. We've got about 125 people signed in here. So some of you do. Uh, some of you love it so much you'll go to the trouble of making it. Um, but most of us opt for this version. And the reason that we do that is because it's more scalable, right? It's, you can buy as many as you want. It uh, has a very predictable cost. And it's easy to do. It doesn't take very much time. So This is what I would compare. Traditional effective e-learning that was built from scratch that costs you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, you say, oh, well, this is like homemade bread. It, you know, we all love it. All, this is what we would do if we could. We'd build everything perfectly and, and have this and enjoy it, and it would work great. But it's not scalable, so we, 
we go with the less scalable version, we sacrifice some of the quality, and we convert PowerPoints. But again, that leads to that question, okay, can I do this fast and cost-effectively and still get quality? A lot of times, um, there's, a, there's an assumption that, that no. And technologies are getting better at handling this um, trade-off here. And that's really what we're talking about here. And the philosophy behind uh, what I call the instructional pattern philosophy. So is the PowerPoint conversion really better? Um, not necessarily. I, the, at the same trade show I mentioned before, a woman standing next to the booth turned to me and said, you know, I've used tools to convert PowerPoint. We did that for a year, and then we sort of woke up one day and, and we thought, what do we have now? And, and really, we just had PowerPoints online, which wasn't a whole lot better. I mean, at least it was online, and that's good. That, that does afford some improvement. But we're, we're going for instructional quality. So, of course, some of the problems with the PowerPoint solution usually results in an ineffective instruction uh, by itself. It's boring. We all have had a, if you've ever been in a room where you're just watching PowerPoint or listen to somebody go on and on, like, <laughs> sort of like this webinar. <laughs> hope, hope it's not too boring. Um, SMEs have a hard time creating effective training when left to themselves. Um, so you might say, oh, we, we've got subject matter experts and they know how to use PowerPoint so we can let them create e-learning, but then they end up turning in a lot of garbage, even though it's you know a lot of content. They don't know what to include, what not to include, things like that. And maintaining courses in PowerPoint can often require re-recording, reconverting. It can be tedious. So again, the, the solution here lies in instructional patterns. And I know I spent quite a bit of time sort of talking about the problems, but really to understand the improvements that have been made, we want to understand what these problems are and where we've come from on that. So the concept is to embed instructionally effective interactions in a form-based data-driven template. So what does an instructional pattern mean? Well, this concept is taken basically from some, uh, basically from programming. Um, in programming, uh, coders, you know, the programmers, they often encounter similar problems. As an example, a programmer might need to sort a list from A to Z. And instead of trying to figure out how to do that in, in programming, they might look in a, a code pattern book. So they call them code patterns. And so they say, oh, I want to sort something from A to Z. How do I do that? They look it up. Oh, here's some code. They just copy the code, and it's done. They don't have to try to figure it out. So they might, and you might have another another problem. A programmer might need to create a search. I want to search through this website. How do I do it? Well, instead of programming it from scratch, they use a pattern. Somebody else already figured it out. So we can apply the same concept with instructional problems. So what's an instructional pattern? It's applying a proven method to a similar problem instead of reinventing the wheel. So let's take a look at some examples. Now, of course, we could. Um, and instructional designers love to do this. They encounter a problem. They say, oh, we need to teach this or that concept. We need to help somebody learn soft skills. We need to teach software simulation. Well, an instructional designer loves nothing more than creating their own kind of solution that they think is designed specifically and perfectly for that situation. But the problem is to implement it would require all this custom work. And so, and instructional designers are a lot like artists. Um, we have a hard time giving up what we think is the in instructional purity of something. So we say, oh, you know, this, this it needs to be this way because this is the very best way to teach this, this concept or the very best way to teach this principle. And, um, and in some ways, programmers are similar. Um, programmers can spend uh, hours, days, weeks, months uh, trying to refine how they do something. Um, not all programmers are that way. But instructional designers often just want to design for the specific, the very specific problem they're in, rather than generalizing the problem and following patterns that have already been well adopted to address that problem. So the most common pattern 
in instructional design that it has existed from the day one of e-learning is assessment. So the problem is assessment. So instead of some instead of an instructional designer saying, gee, I need to figure out how to assess the learner's knowledge, I wonder what kinds of interactions I could build. And they might ask that question still, because that's still a valid question if you're doing instructional design. But instead of trying to come up with something completely random or from scratch or original, they will most likely rely on, oh, well, let's see, common ways of assessing knowledge are true, false, multiple choice, fill in the blank, you know, essay questions. They'll start with those and say, will these methods solve the problem I've got? What's funny is most instructional designers don't follow the same process for other kinds of instructional problems. So, but we really should. Um, the reason that we think about true, false, multiple choice, fill in the blank, essay questions, is because they've been adopted and well accepted over years of assessment tests, right, before e-learning even began. And so it's natural for us to look at those instructional patterns and apply those solutions and, and think about applying those solutions. Um, what's not immediately clear is what we do about other kinds of learning activities. So again, uh, we want to take whatever might, might be our detailed problem and extrapolate from that what is the, the the higher general problem we're dealing with and then is there a pattern an instructional pattern that, that has become adopted or that we've found or discovered in other places that we can use for that that helps us one make our instructional design faster and two if there's already if it's already been coded into a template then we can develop it much quicker so we're saving time on both part both ends and and costs as well so let's look at some examples uh, beyond assessment. So here's an example. A detailed problem is that the learner needs to learn and practice dozens of new terms. So terminology for sales training course. I remember we built a course for Lockheed Martin many years ago that had hundreds of acronyms because anything with the military has a lot of acronyms. We had to deal with this question of how do we how do we teach terms and definitions? Because until they know the terms and definitions, they're not gonna they're not gonna know how to understand anything else. And um, that's that's a problem in a lot of courses. Uh, maybe you don't have as many terms and definitions, but the the higher level problem is not how do we teach these sales terms, but how do we teach terms and definitions in general? How do we get people to learn vocabulary? That's the real question. And so. Let's look at some potential solutions. First of all, embedded glossary terms, right? This is one way, hey, they don't need to know the terms. They can just click the text where they see it, and they can get the definitions as they come along. So maybe that's one way. So that's one pattern, right? So that may be one way to solve it. Another way may be a hangman game. Let me show you an example. Just give me a second to move that over here and get to the right place. I'm in the wrong spot here. Jump to the right spot in this slide. So instead of saying here are the terms and here are the definitions, maybe you make a game uh, where they have to try to guess the terms. And why might this be more or less effective? Well, because they're having to focus so long on the one term, maybe they're more likely to remember it. The point is that um, that this is one way that this has been solved, right? So the question sort of details the term. You might even have more, more feedback other than correct and say, oh yes, here is more information about that term. So this would be one way to allow them to practice the different terms and definitions in a game format. So you might consider that. Um, how long would it take to build this? Well, 
um, if, the, if it's already been built once and it's templatized, made into a template, it takes no longer than typing in the terms and the, the uh, feedback. The questions, terms, and feedback. That's all it takes. You don't have to worry about development. You don't have to worry about designing the interaction, right? So you save on development time and instructional design time. Now what you might be compromising, again, remember, sometimes we have to compromise in instructional purity for something scalable. What you might be compromising is you might think, oh, you know, this, this Hangman game would be so much better if it did this or it did that. And, and so if you're going to go with some pattern or something that's already been used, you get the scalable benefits of it, but you may have to compromise and say, well, you know, this is, this is good enough for the thing that I'm trying to work with. Um, let me show you another example here. So hangman game might be one way to deal with, with that problem, a, def, a, 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 ter, a vocabulary or terms and definition problem. Another one might be a mouse over interaction that has a drag and drop matching exercise. So maybe they have to mouse over each term and then they have to place the uh, term with the right definition to see if they can do that to help them practice. And maybe you mix some of these things together depending on how much you want them to to work on vocabulary. And I'm not saying these are the only patterns, but the point is these are already accepted kinds of ways of dealing with terms and definitions. And so why reinvent the wheel? So let's take a look at this other example. Give me just a moment here to find the right page. So here's another example where uh, we have some instructions here at the beginning and then the learner puts their mouse over the terms to learn about the terms. Okay, why is this better instructionally than just listing the terms and the definitions out in text? Well, there's something about intention, right? The learner wants to see when they put their mouse over it, they want to know. So they get the, the uh, information at the time they want to know it, and it's also chunked up so it's not, <coughs> excuse me, it's not all showing at once, which is an, an ins a simple but important instructional concept. So that's pretty basic. However, um, then we also have a practice button here where they can try to match things together. So they try to drag and drop these to the right area. Let's see, on sale. No, that's the wrong one. <clears throat> okay, on sale. So I matched that correctly. So we get some instant feedback. We also see the term along with the definition. How long does it take to create this kind of interaction where they put the mouse over the terms, they see the definitions, they do a drag and drop activity? Again, the the benefit or the the uh, the benefit of instructional patterns is um, a lot of times well if if tools are based on instructional patterns they're going to have um, an easy way to build that template so how long does it take to build this you simply fill out the terms and definitions so you choose the right template right based on what you're trying to do and you fill out the template which is just terms and definitions, and that interaction is built for you. So again, that save, what does that save us? It saves on instructional design time, saves on development time. And once you start using similar patterns throughout your course, throughout your courses, <coughs> excuse me, Once you start using um, template-based interactions that are based on instructional patterns throughout your courses, your learners are going to be uh, start recognizing these interactions, and the learning interactions become more transparent, and they're interacting with the content. So they're not spending so much time trying to figure out oh, how does this interaction work and and all of that. Okay, let's look at another problem here. And that is the problem of 
how to handle effectively uh, effectively handle customer complaints. Um, so that's not the higher level problem or the generalized problem. So we extrapolate from that. What do we need to teach or have them practice? They need to practice soft skills. It's not a quantifiable answer. It's not just about customer complaints. So we don't need to build something specific for customer complaints. What we really need is to build something that can handle soft skill, um, soft skill um, practice. Application is the word I'm looking for. So being able to help them practice and try to apply soft skills that they've learned in the e-learning course. Well, the, the, the general parameters of that is that a soft skill can have multiple levels of effectiveness. It requires critical thinking. So the main question is, how do we teach principle-guided critical thinking? How do we teach that? How do we help them learn that, um, internalize it in e-learning? That's different than teaching something like software simulation which is straightforward. You have a right and a wrong way to do things. Um, it doesn't require a lot of judgment other than maybe deciding when to do certain functions in certain software. But how to use the software is very quantifiable. How to effectively handle a customer complaint, not necessarily real quantifiable. Um, there might be steps that we give them, but it could go anywhere. So is are there patterns for helping with that? Well, let's take a look at some samples. So we'll look at two different ways of two different ways of, of dealing with this and they're essentially two levels of simulation. And whoops, I'm in the wrong place here. Go to the marketplace. The marketplace um, has some samples. These are interactions based on instructional patterns, you might say, built by users in the Rapid Intake community that can be plugged in to Rapid Intake tools. And they um, are for sale or are given away free sometimes that you can just download and plug into the Rapid Intake tool. You can think of it as something like an app store um, for Rapid Intake. So as an example, here is one way that one pattern that one instructional designer has made to handle soft skills and helping the learner process how to handle certain situations. So as the description says here, how can you include interactivity when a situation is not black or white? Or when you want the learner to interpret and reflect upon information? This interaction allows the students provide at, uh, to respond at length to a scenario, then provides them with an interpretation to compare to their own. So if we look at this, make the screen a little bigger here. We look at the example. It's a pretty simple example. But again, this has become an accepted and well-adopted way, just one way, and there are other ways, and I'll show you more complex and perhaps more effective ways. But this is one way, an easy way, to help teach critical thinking skills that are not quantifiable. So you, you pose the problem, then you let the learner type their response. And then you click view answer. Okay, So you, you end up having a question, a response, and then you look at the way that this scenario um, the scenario designer or the instructional designer put it. Okay. So that's that's uh, the one. I guess what I call a, a simple simulation. It's it, only a simulation in the sense that I've, I've experienced a problem. Now I'm trying to figure out how to respond, and then I get some feedback, and it's pretty open ended. It's not a simulation in that there's only one step. It's not very in-depth. It's really just how do you respond at this one step. So let's look at another example, which is the branching scenario simulation. Okay, and again, this is a pattern that has been adopted. We used to create these from scratch um, when we used to build e-learning courses from scratch. And this pattern has been adopted.
to help train soft skills simulation or soft skills uh, critical thinking skills. So there's a problem and the learner gets to choose how they're going to respond. But instead of typing a response, they get to choose from a variety of responses. In this case, the way this um, interaction has been built, up to four different responses. The problem can be supported by media such as image or video. Um, or it could just be text. Some of the best branching scenarios that I've ever seen were text-based. And so um, you don't have to have great media to make a good scenario. What really makes a scenario good is, is it engaging? Is a hard, problem hard to solve? Is it relevant to the learner? Things like that. But of course, media always helps make it more interesting and more realistic. So why not add some photos or some video? Um, these, this particular interaction or simulation was built in front of a live trade show. Um, and an, uh, at a, a trade show audience to show how quickly we could build simulations so the pictures aren't all that great. But the point is, you can use this pattern. Uh, the, even though this is about customer service, the pattern is how do we teach soft skills? Well, we pose a problem, we let the learner choose the response. Now they can click on one of these responses or they can also listen to the audio. So what if all the text here was exactly the same but it was just how it was said that was different? So I'm going to go ahead and click one here. And you see it branches to another point in the scenario. So a branching scenario usually has multiple outcomes rather than just one path through the scenario. And the learner gets to experiment. You can see the progress meter is telling me I didn't do so well. And the photo is telling me that as well. And I'm just going to keep picking a path here. Now I'm at one end of the path. And it looks like I did about as poorly as I could have. So as a learner, I can click Show Feedback, see the step. Here's the first step in the, in the scenario. Here's the scenario problem, my response, uh, feedback from the scenario designer. And how many points did I get for that choice? Well, minus two. And I can just scroll through and walk through the scenario. And then I can start over and try it again. So. Is this concept, this way to apply soft, uh, uh, this branching scenario, is this concept a brand new concept? No. People have been making branching scenarios for a long time. When you look at the popular Choose Your Own Adventure books from way back when, they were really branching scenarios, which is what made them fun. You could choose your ending, and by choosing your ending, experiment. And so that's really what this this pattern is based on is the the experimentation and the ability to choose and, and simulate failure and success so that the learner can have some experiences in their head before they go out in the real world and try it. Now there are other ways there um, to handle so, uh, soft skill simulation and soft skill uh, tr training. Um, and they can be on a, a wide scale. Again, like we said before, you can go from, you can do everything from something simple to something very full and complex, like a full uh, simulation and a flight simulator or something. Obviously, that's not soft skills, but you can have a full soft skill simulation, which is more like what Clark Aldrich built with the leadership um, simulation that he built. Um, but what is scalable? What can I do in my e-learning course now for very little cost, very little time, doesn't take so much, doesn't add so much overhead to the project. All of these things can be built by just um, filling out forms. How do you build this? You just fill out the forms. You, you say, oh, step number one in the scenario is this, and it's going to link over to this step, and um, here, here are the choices and the feedback and so on. So you just focus on the content. Again, you don't have to worry about designing how the interaction is going to work. You don't have to worry about programming the interaction. You just have to worry about figuring out the content for the interaction. So how it branches, you know, what, what it's branching to, what the feedback is, and all of that. And so um, it saves you a lot of time. And you can add these kinds of interactions very quickly to your courses without a lot of overhead. Let me share one more example with you.
this is one of uh, ten new interactions we're building right now, and so uh, it doesn't have a lot of great content in it. But this interaction has to do with categorization. So if you want to, the, the problem being, you know, the, the, the general problem being how do we help someone learn or practice the differences between similar but different categories. So this could be perhaps products in a line of, uh, a line of products that are similar but slightly different. Um, could be uh, different types of service that you might offer and how to, uh, how to categorize incoming service calls or, or whatever the different similar but different things are. So there's instructions at the beginning and then there are these different categories where you would put the labels here and then the, the term or the text that they need to put into the category would show up here and they try to drag and drop it into the right category. Now this one has a little bit of gameplay because there's a timer associated with it. So they're trying to put it in the right category before the time runs out and so on. Um, once they are done, they can click show answers or restart if they want to start over. And when they click show answers, the timer stops and they can choose to see my responses, which are already there, or correct responses. Once they see correct responses, then they can kind of go back and compare, oh, how did I, I see this one in this category and so on. So again, if we weren't thinking about instructional patterns, we might say, how do we teach categorization? Um, well, let's design some interaction. Well, that takes a lot of instructional design time, a lot of programming time. But in this case, we might say, how do we teach categorization? Oh, here's a category interaction. Um, so let's use that. Let's, let's, let's try that, see if that would work. And, and so it may not be exactly what you want, but it is close enough that it's a scalable solution. Right, and so you get very this way. You, you get very highly interactive content because all you got to do to build this is fill out a form. You get highly interactive content very quickly and inexpensively compared to building it by scratch. Now, there's another type of categorization built out on our marketplace. Let me show you that one. It's also very nice. Um, over to the right spot here. Too many windows open. Get myself lost. I'm going to go back out to the marketplace just to pull up the sample. And we'll go down to um, let's see where to go. There we go, this corkboard interaction. So this is, this is pretty similar. It's just a different interface. Um, and it's, it's got very, I, I like the interface quite a bit. Um, it's not the same, same interaction, but you can see some similarities. So we've got, I'm going to try to tack these up, and so on, right? So again, uh, the point is that instead of building these from scratch, you're using, you're thinking about what is the high-level concept? Is there, are there interactions that have been built to address that high-level concept? And can I use them in my authoring tool? Some other tools you may want to consider. Um, there's a tool called Raptivity which is, um, many of you may already use that, but it's a tool that lets you build interactions to plug into uh, using with any authoring tool. And they have a lot of interactions. Some of them I like, some of them I, um, a lot of them I don't like, but you can uh, use those with rapid intake tools. You can use them with a lot of other tools. Um, another tool that we're releasing here pretty soon, let me just show you a sneak peek at what's called the Rapid Swift Maker, which is similar in some ways to Raptivity, except that you are going to choose the type of interaction, insert your text images, apply a theme, and then download, and then you can use it. And you can use it with any of these tools. 
So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that one, but that's another place that you can find interactions that might work for different instructional problems. So again, instructional patterns are a scalable, repeatable solution to a common instructional problem. So let me just jump past this instructional or the branching scenario. So what is the way to break this quality versus quantity trade-off? How do we make sure we build quality courses without having to sacrifice a lot on the quality or the quantity, meaning how fast we build? And it is to first identify what the problem is, translate it to a higher level problem, meaning instructional problem, then decide what type of interaction or instructional approach is going to effectively help the learner accomplish that, and then decide what the instructional form-driven template needs to include to be effective. And then you, you want to go look for something like that, or you go out and browse the existing tools and find something that may work. Um, that way you can add interactivity very quickly to your courses, and even if you converted your course with PowerPoint, you can create a highly interactive course very fast. So there are a couple of things. Um, as I mentioned, you may need a new process. That's kind of the process. This is the technology. You may need to acquire new technology, either build a structure yourself where interactions are driven by external content so you can easily reuse those interactions, or you can get existing technology like technology at rapid intake. And this is where I am going to just briefly mention our two tools, um, Proform, Rapid eLearning Studio, which is a desktop-based tool, and Unison, which is a web-based collaborative tool which solves the collaborative problem of um, the collaborative problem of e-learning development. So, uh, working with a lot of develop uh, a lot of different people on the project can be a challenge, but it's very common to have to work with lots of different people on an e-learning project. And so, Unison allows you to. Uh, skirt the bottleneck that is the content owners, you know, there are always more content owners than professional instructional designers, so Unison can help you move past that and have the content owners help you with development where, where the professional developers become coaches and facilitators, or you can use the tool uh, at, just to develop in the same way that you've been doing it, but collaborate with your subject matter experts more easily. So that's Unison, that's a web-based collaborative solution. So that concludes the main part of the webinar. I'm now going to go through and answer as many questions as I can in the time that we have. If you do have any questions about rapid intake or about the webinar, feel free to email me or give me a call. That's my direct line. If, if I'm hard to get a hold of, I may uh, pass you on to somebody on our team to uh, help me um, with, with your questions, but I'm happy to, I would always love to hear from you if you have any questions or comments. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull up the question panel here, and I apologize if any of you asked questions a long time ago. Um, we'll just get them answered here as uh, as many as we can here. I just wanted to make sure we had a chance to get through all the content. So one of the questions is from Sathya, and he says, will this work for a technical audience? So one of the things that rapid intake tools help with is the the um, ability to scale or uh, customize and extend, as, as like in the marketplace, you saw that you could add other interactions that plug into our tools. And so, depending on what the solution is, sometimes you may choose an instructional pattern that doesn't have a template built for it. So you need to build a template so you can do that. Um, these kinds of things 
can certainly help with the technical audience, but it depends on the content. You may, you may need a different template than what exists, and so again, you may want to customize that. Okay, Robert asks, are these templates based on AS2 or AS3? The ones that you've seen are based on AS2. Um, we do have an AS3 player um, in beta right now uh, that you can see, get access to, and we're currently converting all of our templates to AS3. Amir says, so is rapid e-learning essentially using templates appropriate for the learning challenge? Um, you could say it that way. Rapid e-learning is, again, a broad term. A lot of people associate it with PowerPoint conversion. Um, but certainly, our, our, our approach to rapid e-learning is based on interactive e-learning, so based on templates that have been designed around an instructional pattern that is surfaced um, that is appropriate for the learning challenge. I like how you summarized that in that way, using template-based interactions appropriate for the learning challenge. Um, Anthony says, you like the Rapid Swift Maker? Can't wait to see it. Glad, glad you like that. Um, Carol says, is special software and technical expertise needed to use Rapid Intake tools? Well, you do have to have the software from Rapid Intake, but beyond that, no extra software is usually needed. <coughs> Excuse me. I've been talking a long time. Um, and um, you do need... Uh, if you don't have the desktop version, if you use the web-based version, you need a web connection and things like that. But as far as being able to learn, having expertise, you really don't need any specific expertise. You can get, they're very easy to use, and you can get any extra training you need on, off our website, and we also hold webinars like this. Anthony says, where can I find more information on the concept of instructional patterns? Well, um, there is some information if you just search on the internet. But this is something I've been stumping on for a long time, and so these are really my philosophies about how to address things given my experience. Um, you may find uh, concepts on instructional patterns on the Internet. I haven't looked uh, for a couple of years, really, um, into what, how, what other people are saying about, about instructional patterns or whether they're even defining it the same way, because this is uh, just what we've found as we've been in the industry for over 15 years to be one of the most effective things. So hopefully that helps. Um, I know there are other people that do define it in a similar way. You may find instructional patterns defined differently too, more about uh, a pattern of instructional theory or something like that. I look at it as a much more discrete um, problem, meaning I need to solve this specific instructional problem. Um, how do I do that? Rather than how do I what kind of theory or pattern should I use to design an entire course? But you could also say that's an instructional pattern as well. And there's lots of methodologies out there. There are a lot of methodologies for a course creation, how to, how to design it well. <clears throat> Charlotte says, what phase would you say we are in now? Are we still in the confusion phase, uh, maybe the collaborative phase? Um, definitely not in the confusion phase anymore. E-learning is becoming so rapidly adopted. Every organization is looking for e-learning tools of one kind or another, um, even small organizations. Really, um, because it, the tools are so accessible and easy to use now, um, and you can get so much benefit from them, there's really no reason that any organization of any size over, say, 50 employees shouldn't have at least one license of an e-learning tool, because you're going to save so much time over building things from scratch or trying to get by with just PowerPoint and doing things, um, uh, you know, in person. So we're well past the confusion stage. Um, I think the confu <laughs> I think um, there's different parts of the e-learning industry. So the mobile learning industry is actually in the silver bullet stage, right? Everybody's saying mobile learning is going to be the solution. Um, and... Um, and, and we're sort of in, the, in there pushing that as well because our tools, uh, we're developing um, mobile output as well. Um, so you might say in traditional e-learning, we're, we're into the, the full adoption, sort of the big wave. Um, 
everybody's moving to building e-learning on their own. And there's still lots of people to, to outsource it and are specialists, and there's, that's great. That's always going to be a part of the ecosystem. But, um, but we're well beyond that confusion stage now. So Troy says, what makes you different than Articulate and Gage? Well, um, rapid intake, there, there are lots of differences, and I, I won't spend a lot of time talk, <coughs> excuse me, talking about this here, but um, if, you, if you have a specific, um, if you want to know more details about the differences, I can send you a document or you know, we can exchange by email. But let me just briefly say, you know, articulate, articulate Presenter and Articulate Engage have some similarities, meaning they can cover PowerPoint and Engage has some interactions. Um, some of the most significant differences are in, one, our PowerPoint conversion is more powerful in some ways. It converts all the animations, for example. Um, it converts triggers, so you can actually build interactivity right in PowerPoint, um, basic interactivity, but interactivity nonetheless. Things like that. That's on the PowerPoint conversion side. In terms of Engage, um, the interactions that you find in our tools are similar in the sense that you can build using forms and things like that. Um, I think we have quite a few more interactions than they do, and our marketplace has, has quite a few more from what I understand. I haven't been out to look at, at what they have lately, but um, but anyway, I think that's that's something there. Also, our tools are extensible in, based on Flash, so um, you're actually it's all built on Flash, and, and of course, coming soon, HTML5. It's not tied to PowerPoint. It's um, it's They are uh, more open technologies, I guess, is one way to put it. Uh, and there are a lot of other differences. Maria asked, do we receive a certificate of, of attendance? Um, no, there's no certificates given out uh, for this webinar, but um, if you need some kind of proof or something, I'm happy to respond to an email saying that you attended, if you wanted to shoot that to me. Aaron asks, "Is are these kinds of interactions good for live webinars? Well, they can be. Um, challenge is getting them to each person to be able to take them in the webinar. Um, there may be tools out there that do that. I'm not real familiar with any, but I think they could be used that way. Sometimes people will use these kinds of interactions in, <coughs> excuse me, in uh, instructor-led training where they'll say, okay, now we're going to pause and everybody's going to do this interaction. So they have a little e-learning piece in the middle of their instructor-led training that everybody works on. So that's another related concept. Brett asked if the recording or the conference is recording, the web conference it is. So um, we'll have a link hopefully, assuming the recording went well, I'll have a link hopefully out in a couple of days. Jenny asked, what are the delivery, what, what about the delivery environment? What are the requirements? Well, uh, it's web-based, obviously, uh, delivery or CD-ROM, um, but most people deliver web-based. Um, if you need to do learning tracking, learner tracking, like um, collecting scores and uh, how long they how long they spent in the course and when they completed it and things like that. <clears throat> You're going to need a learning management system, and Rapid Intake uh, has a learning management system. But there are lots of learning management systems, uh, aka LMSs, out on the market. You just um, need to know what uh, you need there. But as far as delivering the course itself, if you if you're not worrying about tracking, it's just in, an internet connection is all you need. And then of course, um, mobile output is coming up soon. So being able, being able to access these kinds of things through mobile devices. Okay, Troy asked, what tool did you use to create your presentation? Uh, well, we're using GoToMeeting or GoToWebinar, and uh, there, are lots of, there are lots of different kinds of um, synchronous web training tools. Um, and then, of course, PowerPoint to do the presentation. For doing one-way presentations, certainly PowerPoint is still uh, helpful. I don't want to badmouth PowerPoint too much. You can certainly use it as a basis for content. It's great for presentations like this one, but um, it's really a uh, one-way one -way tool. And in e-learning, you really need to uh, pull in uh, interactivity or engage the learner in interactivity. Tony said, I noticed that one of the products works with Articulate. How do they work together? Well, we have two products that work with Articulate. One is called Review. It's a collaborative review solution. I didn't mention that here, but that's one of them. Um, it allows you to post an Articulate course online and collect feedback from anybody. Um, the one that I did show is called Rapid SwiftMaker. 
and that's uh, due to be released in just a week or two here. And um, that uh, allows you to log in, uh, create your, <coughs> excuse me, create your course, I'm sorry, your interaction. Um, and there's a lot of different options there. It's a flexible interaction building tool. And then you export it to Flash. Then you can just pull that Flash movie right into Articulate or Captivate or Rapid Intake Tools. Chris asked, what types of applications can these, can these interactions be imported to? Well, um, the Rapid SwiftMaker one can be imported to anything that takes a Flash movie. Um, the other interactions uh, that I showed you, a lot of them are integrated in with our tools. So you have to have a Rapid Intake tool to, um, because they're just part of the development environment. And if you want to take a closer look at our tools, you want to attend a different webinar that just goes over a demonstration of our tools called Proform or Unison. They're very powerful course development tools, award-winning tools, and these interactions uh, get pulled or just part of the development environment. Dalvinder says, uh, can I create a template using any of the rapid intake tools? Uh, yes, you can. Um, that's part of our difference is the ability to build your own templates. Connie asks, can I... <clears throat> Can templates be customized to reflect the company brand? Um, completely. So you can start with a basic template and just add your logo, for example, as a simple way, change some of the colors. Or you can create a completely custom template. Either a professional services team can do that, or you can get any Flash developer to do that for you. In fact, let me just show you real briefly, um, since you're asking about that, some samples of custom templates. And, and when we're t talking templates here, um, we're talking about the course interface. So let me just scroll up here and go to another area. So you can see here are some sample templates. Uh, these are created by our <coughs> uh, customers. So the, this template does not, this course interface does not exist in our tool. Uh, it's one that's designed by our customers, by a customer. Um, but you see you have full control over the look and feel. Um, each template is, can be very different from any other. So you can come out and look at some of these. Um, these are just some of the different examples. Uh, we'll take a look at this one here as well. Right. So you have full control, and this is another nice thing, is, is our, our software makes it so easy to make it uh, your course feel very custom. Um, none of our branding is anywhere in the courses. You can completely remove it, <coughs> and you can build, <coughs> excuse me, you can build any kind of interface that you need. Um, so I'll just look at some of the remaining questions here. Some of you are saying thank you for the presentation. Well, I want to express my thanks for you attending and taking your valuable time to hear what I had to say. I hope, hope it was helpful. So you're very welcome. Brett asks, uh, does your tool also provide the ability to record software simulations? Uh, no, it doesn't. A lot of people will use other tools to do that and pull, that, pull the recordings into our tools. Um, that may be something we add in the future. Brett asks, uh, will rapid intake track the learner responses, their answers, time in the SWIFT interaction, and report this time to some sort of database or LMS? Um, yes, it does. It's all SCORM conformant. Um, so it does depend on the interaction. Some interactions don't track anything other than the time spent on that page. But uh, many of our interactions that keep track of scores will also pass the score. Certainly the quizzes uh, are specifically designed around that. Hey, Joan asks, uh, we plan on making the bullet feature with more options in Proform um, and spell checking. Um, spell checking is going to be part of it in the next release, um, which has been in Unison uh, for a while. So in Proform 4 and also um, bulleting 
may. It, it depends on what you're referring to there. So you may want to shoot me an email. That that got I got through all the questions here. So <clears throat> you're very welcome to all of all of those of you who have attended and and uh, have said thank you. And I appreciate your attendance again as well. That's going to going to conclude the webinar today. Again, please. Uh, feel free to contact me at this uh, address here, Garen Hess at rapidintake.com, or calling me directly here, or feel free to contact anyone else at Rapid Intake for additional information. And I hope regardless of whether you use Rapid Intake or some other authoring tool, that this has been helpful and that it will help you create more effective courses um, in all the e-learning development you do. So have a great day, everybody. We'll see you later.